Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonko. As we present to you the final episode of our Saturday show until the falls, we are inviting some of our favorite guests to join us as we round up the year. And joining me now is Professor Moses Sochano, who is the Professor of African History at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Professor Chan, welcome to Sahara TV. Thanks for having me, Rudolf. Um, so, uh, it's been a while. Um, you, I know that you went to Nigeria recently. Uh, can you tell us what you went to do and your impression of the country after the election of uh, General Buhari as president? Well, I made two uh, trips to Nigeria. The first one, uh, I was part of uh, a group of professors, um, including one of your regular guests, uh, Professor Paris Adesomi. Uh, but we, uh, and another professor from North America, we went to give seminars uh, to uh, the faculty at Kwara State University in Ilori, in the central part of the country. Um, I recently just got back from another trip where I was part of uh, also a group of scholars uh, who went to Calabar to uh, church uh, to deliberate on this new philosophy of uh, growth and um, economic development called Africapitalism. Uh, so, you know, uh, my impressions, I, I think um, talking to people in the country during those two visits, I got a sense that um, there, is, there is a sense that, you know, Buhari has not done any harm. And, you know, the first rule of politics is do no harm. And in that sense, there is some stability. Uh, there is a sense that he has gotten, he has stopped the hemorrhaging, he has stopped the leakage, that things are stabilizing. Uh, but I, I've got to say at the same time, there is a sense that uh, you know, that no, there's, there's a sense that there's no clarity as to the future uh, direction of the country at this point because of uh, the lack of appointments in uh, the government, the lack of uh, constitution of the cabinet, and the absence of information in the public space, the absence of uh, policy directive, policy pronouncements. And as you know, where there's a the dearth of information, uh, rumors are made up, uh, you know, People have got to fill the information space somehow, and they fill it usually with rumors and speculations. And speculations and rumors can undermine the process of uh, governance. So that's, that's my general sense. But let me say one more thing, which is the electricity situation. There is a sense, I get a sense by talking to some people that there's an improvement. And I think that seems to give people a sense of hope. Uh, whatever the cost of it, there's, uh, there's a debate as to what is, uh, who takes the credit, who should take the credit. But that doesn't matter to Nigerians. Nigerians are just happy to see any improvements in critical social sectors. Mm. Now, you talked about the sense that um, the, the certain parts, aspects of the government are not yet set up. What do you make of the recent intervention by the National Peace Committee in, in, in the politics of Nigeria? Uh, what do you make of their, their recent visit to Buhari, visit to Jonathan? and their intervention in an attempt to probe the government, uh, the former government of Jonathan? I think, it's, I think it's well within their democratic rights to do what they've been doing, to go to this, uh, these leaders to try to defuse the tension in the country. Uh, only an escapist would um, argue that there's no tension in the country. Quite frankly, we are still recovering from you know, the election in certain ways. And it seems to me that, you know, in some quarters of the country, even online, uh, in cyberspace, uh, the election is still being re litigated, it's still being litigated online and in so many discussive, discussive spaces in Nigeria. So what, they, what I understand them to be doing is to go around to the critical stakeholders to try to see how they can bring everyone uh, to a common agenda, which is an agenda of peace, an agenda of, uh, you know, just uh, unity, working together, the acrimony, the, the, the acrimony, the bickering, the back and forth accusations uh, are things that really, at this point, uh, we can't afford. There are so many critical problems uh, confronting the country that need to be tackled headlong. And in an atmosphere of acrimony and bitterness and recriminations, I think those uh, problems uh, may not be tackled uh, properly. So I think that's what I understand them to be doing. I think their mission has been misunderstood a little bit. Um, uh, in the sense that, you know, people say, well, they've gone to the president to urge him not to probe the pa immediate past uh, administration. Uh, I'm not privy to their discussions with the president, so I can't speak to that. What I will say, though, is that 
any effort right now, in my opinion, to douse the tension, uh, the, t the tension which can really undermine governance, which can, we can really, which can really prevent a national consensus with regards to critical issues confronting the country. Any effort in, the, in that direction should be welcome. And I think we Nigerians uh, should stop imputing ulterior motives uh, to people, uh, you know, who try to do those kinds of work. I mean, there's room for those, that kind of job. And if there's evidence that the committee has engaged in any acts of impropriety, have tried to impede investigations that are ongoing, then people should present them. I, for one, want to be persuaded one way or the other. So that's, that's what I think of the committee's work. I think there's room for their work. And I think uh, we should give them the, the benefit of the doubt without throwing around the kinds of accusations that we're seeing. There needs to be a healthy debate as to how do we move this country forward and where do we go from here? Mm. Uh, do we, how far back do we need to go in terms of the probe? Uh, I think there needs to be a national conversation as to a, a, a reasonable, healthy cut-off date. Which administration should we start with? Where should we stop? And it's not about who gets pro whether we should probe or not, or whether we should investigate our past or not. I think to go forward, we have to go backwards. That's what we historians like to say. So the probe, some sort of accountability, some sort of uh, searchlight on the past is absolutely necessary. However, then we need to determine the parameters. Um, to the extent that the Peace Committee has broached that subject, has broached that conversation, I think they deserve some credit for doing that, even if they did it inadvertently. You know, uh, the other things are just uh, details that we can argue about. Now, one of the members of that committee, Bishop Kuka, has been receiving um, a lot of um, attack on, uh, on social media. Uh, one of the things that he said was that government officials, former government officials, are being lynched in public by people when there are no charges against them yet. Uh, do you think he's on point, or do you think that he misread the mood of the nation? Yes, I'll, 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 I, think, uh, I think that's a fair statement to make. Um, because people don't have, Nigerians have become very impatient, and justifiably so, uh, because uh, they've seen a lot of impunity in the immediate uh, past political history of the country, a lot of impunity, a lot of brazen uh, disregard for the yearnings and the aspirations of, the, of, the, of, the, of citizens. And so I don't think they're in the mood for the kind of narrative, or, you know, this kind of mushiness, this kind of nuance. Uh, we, we, they want straightforward, clear-cut answers to the questions that they are posing. And anything that could be read as some sort of, um, you know, to diluting uh, this debate about accountability, about people being held accountable and money is being recovered from people who have stolen public funds, any kind of uh, suggestion uh, that tends to muddy the waters, as it were, uh, I think Nigerians don't have a lot of patience for that kind of discourse. And I think that's where the bishop uh, probably misread the mood of the country by saying what he said. I haven't said that. I think he has a right to his opinion. And I think, uh, and I, and I think to some extent, uh, Nigerians ought to just listen to what he's saying uh, and, and, and go from there. Mm. Now, now, there is this report that money coming to the federal account has been rising, even though the price of uh, crude oil has been going further down. And they attribute that to what they call the Buhari, fear of Buhari. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for the country? Um, I've, I've actually written about this uh, Buhari factor, what I call the, the fear of consequence and the fear of Buhari, whatever you want to call it. I, I like to call it the Buhari factor. But I think there is a sense that there will be consequence. Uh, the, you know, there's, the, the, there's a new order of things. There's a new regime, and uh, I, th I think generally speaking, I would say it's a good thing. Um, I don't see any downside to it in the sense that this is what happens really when you plug the loopholes in government, when you stop the rev revenue from leaking out. This is what happens when you set the right tone from the top. I always like to say that we Africans are very oriented towards authority and that we like to take our example and our cues from people at the top. And so this is what we're seeing now, that Buhari is there. He's a no he has a no-nonsense comportment about him. And he has made it clear that he's not going to put up with any shenanigans and it's not going to be business as usual. And you are seeing institutions that used to be comatose, that used to be dysfunctional, suddenly, inexplicably, uh, rediscovering their missions, rediscovering what they are there to do. Um, you have seen people in government who were pre previously uh, just nonchalant about the business of government suddenly doing the right things and 
you know, en not engaging in the things that they used to engage in. And when that happens, you are going to see savings, you are going to see loopholes being plugged, and more money is going to flow into government. And those monies are going to be used uh, to solve the problems that confront the country. So it's a really good thing, especially as oil prices go, continue to go down and um, renewable energies, renew renewable energy sources come on stream uh, to displace oil, we're going to need a lot more of that. We're not going to need a lot more transparency, a lot more prudence in the way we handle government affairs. And I think Buhari needs to be, should be commended, uh, even though he hasn't done much by way of policy pronouncement, I think by just setting the right tone, and sometimes we underestimate that, we underestimate uh, how, how effective that can be. Mm -hmm. just, just the body language and the comportment and the, the, the pronouncements and the kinds of things you say can send, it can cascade down to the lowest level of government and make people behave and uh, straighten them up. Talking about what people say, uh, in the last few days we had this quote where the former president, um, Jonathan, said that he's just realizing the level of corruption uh, that happened in his government for the first time. Is that, um, do you believe that he didn't know and how can you compare, your historian, how do you compare his administration to that of um, Shehu Shagare that was there in the 80s? Because there was this kind of a sense that the president didn't know what was going on under him. It is quite plausible. Quite frankly, uh, nothing surprises me anymore when it comes to post-colonial African politics or Nigerian uh, politics for that matter. I think the comparison, the comparison you, 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 you brought up is actually quite apt because there's a tradition in this country of people in power being surrounded by people who tell them what they want to hear, who insulate them from the mood of the country, speaking of the mood of the country, who insulate them from uh, you know, discontent and the anger and the frustrations, and, you know, to some extent the problems uh, of the country. So I'm not uh, entirely surprised. You know, it's quite plausible that he actually didn't know some of the things that went on under his administration. The other thing to, to say, though, uh, having given him that, that benefit of the doubt, I think it's also important to say that uh, the, the President Jonathan was never an intellectual, intellectually curious person. He was never very curious. He didn't want to know things. A leader can know things. There are avenues for a leader to know things that his aides will not tell him. You can get yourself out of that cocoon, out of that bubble, and find things out. You can go and read newspapers. You can talk to people. You can sneak out creative Innovative leaders have ways of finding out what is going on. Uh, they can, you can talk to different multiple aides and ha ask tough questions. But we didn't see that attribute in President Jonathan. President Jonathan, I think, seems to me to have been just content with being president and enjoying the perks of the office rather than fulfilling the responsibilities. So I think it's on him. Uh, he can't feel ignorance and, and, and expect sympathy from us now. Uh, in retrospect, no, I don't think it's uh, fair for him to do that. Mm -hmm. I think there were, there, were, there were ways that he could have found out what was going on. I think he was so insecure, he allowed people to tell him what he wanted to hear. Uh, anyone who told him contrary was branded, an enemy was branded, uh, some sort of uh, political detractor. And so he allowed himself to be insulated from the realities of the country. Mm -hmm. And he can only have himself to blame for that. All right, uh, I will try to get in two more questions before we run out of time. Um, the, the guest governor, former governor of Lagos State, uh, Babatunde Fashala, yesterday gave an explanation for why his government spent $400,000 to upgrade a website. What do you make of his explanations? Absolute nonsense. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't like to sugarcoat nonsense, quite frankly. It doesn't work. It doesn't work with me. Uh, I'm pretty sure he has his supporters would uh, buy that explanation. It doesn't just work with me or with most people that I've, uh, I'm in contact with, most Nigerians that I talk to, that I've interacted with online. Uh, the reason is simple. Uh, he basically owns up to it. So initially there was a denial as to whether that money was actually paid. Uh, here it's coming from him now that the money was paid and it was for upgrading a website. Not just a website, but a personal website of his. So there's a fundamental principle at stake here. There's a fundamental issue, which is should Lagos taxpayers' money go into upgrading, building, maintaining, whatever, of a pers the personal website of the governor? And I think it's, the answer is unequivocal, no, that should never happen. Uh, the, personal, the personal website of the governor should not 
are, should not be funded or maintained by government fund. That's his personal website. He uses it to promote himself, to project his image. That's different from his official website as the governor of Lagos State. So that's the fundamental principle. And then, of course, there's a second issue, second and equally egregious issue of does that even an upgrade of a personal website or any website for that matter warrant the spending of $400,000? That's 78 million naira. Uh, unless, unless that website is being built on Mars, or on the moon, <laughs> uh, there's no way you're going to tell me that 78 million uh, would be spent. I mean, that's just political, that's just corruption, that's just ethical violation. Uh, you know, there's no two ways about it. There's no other way to say it. Mm. And this is the kind of corruption we see across the board, all over the country, in different states, where monies are constantly funneled uh, from the Treasury into the hands of political allies and political friends and, 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 all, and the party machinery. So it's possible that he personally didn't benefit from it. But be that as it may, it happened under him, and he was the beneficiary because that was his personal website. They, they, it just doesn't work. So when you, uh, when, you, when you see a story like that from, about someone like uh, Fashola, a senior advocate of Nigeria, one of the governors that people put out there as one of the good ones, what does that say to you about the degree of, of the rots probably that are going on in the system? It's simply indicative of the, of the depth and the breadth of the ethical crisis we have in the country, the, the, the problem of corruption. And that is what, what we should call it. Mm. It's so deep, it's so widespread, that it's almost impossible to find good people. Uh, no one can be, no one is insulated from it. And like I said, it's easy to get sucked into good people, competent people like Fashola, knowledgeable people, enlightened people like Fashola can get sucked into it. So, so and that is how bad things are in Nigeria today. Mm. And that is one of the reasons, it seems to me, that's my theory, I have no proof of it, but it seems to me that that's one of the reasons why Buhari is having a hard time finding people to populate mm. his cabinet. Mm. Because that, that just goes to show that we, over the last five decades or so, uh, we've, we've just institutionalized this culture of corruption that everyone who goes into public service inevitably somehow gets sucked into it and gets smeared in it. So that someone like Fashola, for instance, who is widely celebrated uh, by a lot of people, including myself, as having done a number of good things and uh, I've been a competent leader, cannot even escape mm. the stigma of corruption. Mm. Uh, and if you look at the expenditures listed on that, so it's not just the uh, it's not just the website. website. Yeah, yeah. It's also the bridges yeah. that, that were pedestrian bridges that were built with outrageous sums of money, mm. billions of naira uh, for just pedestrian bridges. I know. So this, these are present acts of corruption. And if someone like that, if Sufasola could be smeared by corruption then we're in deep trouble. And Buhari certainly, you know, in my opinion, has his work cut out for him. Okay, one more question because we're totally out of time. I, I know you're an expert. You understand the middle belt very well. Uh, when I saw this story, I couldn't believe it. The government of Adamawa State will spend $200 million to hire prayer warriors to pray that Boko Haram should come to an end. Um, I thought it was a joke, but apparently something is going on there. Uh, what, do you, what does that say about who we are? Uh, as a historian, can you explain this? How did we get to this point? Well, it's, it's, it's quite simple. Well, first of all, they've come out now to say, well, you know, to try to do some damage control, to try to deny the story. But it, it is what it is. It's on paper. It's documented. They can't run away from it. And, and, and you know, they did say that. Uh, be that as it may, I think the problem has to do with, we, we, you know, this tendency to spiritualize uh, you know, physical, tangible problems. We, we are very escapist people. We like to take uh, problems that should be solved on a terrestrial level. Uh, we like to take those problems to the spiritual realm, where, you know, we can live happily in ignorance and bliss and, and allow, uh, you know, so whatever supernatural forces to go to work on them for us. It's laziness, it's intellectual laziness. It's, I think mean, it speaks to our inability to ask tough questions, to challenge ourselves and to confront issues headlong. Uh, it's a historical problem that we've always had uh, after independence, uh, so that, for instance, prayer becomes a substitute for hard work. Prayer becomes a substitute for holding people accountable, for doing the right things, for constructing the right institutions, for you know reforming our, 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 our government mm. and making the government work for, for, for citizens. So prayer becomes this go-to uh, substitute for that. And it's, it's very lazy. It speaks to our intellectual laziness, but also our political laziness. And also, I think it speaks to a certain desire 
on the part of the political establishment to manipulate people. Knowing how religious we are, our leaders tend to basically steer us in that direction. Mm. And so I think the, 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 the Adamawa state government was hoping that it would appeal to the religious uh, uh, sentiments and religious, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, part of the really spiritual side of uh, the citizens. And uh, once it found out that uh, people were repulsed, um, that, that it revolted, people were revolted by this, this move, uh, they've now moved from that to damage control. Mm. But it, it speaks to a very deep-seated problem that, con that has confronted us for so many decades. Mm. Thank you so much, Professor Moses Achano, for joining us. Thank you. That has been Professor Moses Achano, uh, Professor of African History at Vanderbilt University. When we come back, we are going to talk to some of the experts and some of our friends who have been with us all through this uh, one year and beyond. Um, so stay tuned.